Let me ask you this question. Have you ever wondered what is the difference between justification and sanctification? I've wondered that and I've studied into it and I always thought that I knew what it was. But today we're going to take a look at that very question. What does it mean to be justified by faith? First, let's take a look at what does justified mean. So justified, according to the Strong's Hebrew and Greek Dictionary, it says this. It says, from to render, that is to show or regard as just or innocent, free, justifier, be righteous. So from a standpoint of a sinner, how can we be justified? Because to be justified says is to regard as just or innocent. So how can we as sinners be justified? So, so to better understand, we need to understand the true nature of our problem. Would you agree with that? When Adam and Eve were first created, they were created with holy and righteous characters. Amen? Amen. They were. So we find in Genesis, and you might take your Bibles out, because I don't have it on the screen at the moment, but let's take a look at Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. Let's go back to the beginning and find out what it really means. So in Genesis 1, 26, it says this, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. That is so beautiful the way that the Bible puts that. So man was created in the image of God to bear his likeness. He was, you know, this likeness was not just physical likeness, but also spiritual likeness and relationally. Okay, we, we uh, represent God uh, in relationship with him. So we find in Genesis 2 verse 7, it says this, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So when God breathed into Adam the breath of life, he was imparting to him his own spirit, his own life. Notice that Jesus did, uh, notice what Jesus did to the disciples shortly before his ascension to heaven in John 20, verse 22. So if you turn to John 20, verse 22, it says this. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen? Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So before he went to heaven, before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in, uh, at Pentecost, he breathed upon them what came from them and he said receive ye the Holy Ghost receive you my spirit our first parents had been given holy and righteous natures it was their natural desire to do good and to keep the law of God it was not hard for them to do it was just something that they wanted to do there was nothing within them that desired to sin amen one test was given them that they may prove their love to God and we find that in Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. And it says this, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely what? Die. Thou shalt surely die. Yes, the test that God had given them was small. Now think about this. He gave them all of the trees for, for, uh, for food. Just one. Just one that he held. Exactly. At that time, God had given the command. Eve had not been created at this point. So God had given it to Adam, and Adam then gave it the command to Eve. Thus her knowledge of the prohibition was given to her through her husband, Adam. And so I want to read for some, something from you, uh, for you from the book of Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53. It says this, talking about the tree of knowledge of good and evil, talking about um, when sin first came into this world. It says, the tree of knowledge had been made a test of their obedience and their love to God. So it was a test of their obedience. The Lord had seen fit to lay upon them but one prohibition. How many? One. Just one. 
as to the use of all that was in the garden. But if they should disregard his will in this particular, they would incur the guilt of transgression. Satan was not allowed to follow them um, with continual temptations. He could have access to them only at the forbidden tree. Now notice that. Even, even Satan, he couldn't go and follow them all over the place only at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Should they attempt, she says, to investigate its nature, they would be exposed to his wiles. Notice this point here. It says, they were admonished to give careful heed to the warning which God had sent them and to be content with the instructions. Notice, to be content with what God had said, which he had seen fit to impart upon them. So they had to accept this by faith. So when Eve wandered away from her husband and found herself beside the forbidden tree, she was at first afraid because she was separated from him and that she was in the midst of the tree but felt that she had sufficient wisdom to detect the adversary that, had been, that they had been warned about. Remember, Adam and Eve had been endowed, that means had been given, with a holy and righteous nature. They had no desire to eat of this forbidden tree, no desire whatsoever. Thus, it was Satan's aim to entice them to eat of this fruit. Now, how did he do this? Deception. Exactly, deception. First, he enticed Eve to enter into a conversation with him in the guise of a serpent. And so we notice that in Genesis 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than, all, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Mm -hmm. Now notice something here in how he approached Eve. Okay, he, he took the form of a serpent, right? This was a glorious being at this time. It had wings and it was glittering in gold and it would fly. And so he spoke to her almost like it was the sentiments of her heart as she was gazing upon this forbidden tree. And he said, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now notice this. Did God say that they could not eat of every tree of the garden? No. Satan used a... a we call an obvious overstatement to, so that he could entice her to converse with him. If I said that the sky is green, you would automatically say, no, it is not. It is blue, right? Because and it would elicit you to enter into a conversation with me. So none but God could contend with the devil. Now notice this. He got her to enter into conversation with him. And as soon as she entered into a conversation with him, he knew that he had her because none but God can contend with, that's right, not even Gabriel himself could outwit Satan. Notice this in this, uh, the book called The Story of Redemption, page 32, it says this about Eve. Eve unconsciously at first separated her hus from her husband in her employment. When she became aware of the fact, she felt that there might be danger. So she kind of felt apprehensive. But again, she thought herself secure. Now, why did she think she was secure? She says this, even if she did not remain close by the side of her husband, she had wisdom and strength to know if evil came and to meet it. So she felt that her wisdom was a sufficient guide. Notice in Daniel chapter 10. So if you will turn to Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. It says this in verse 12. Daniel chapter 12, I'm, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 10, 12 and 13. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the, from, from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy, wor uh, for thy words. And so Daniel was praying to God, giving him supplications, and God sent his angel Gabriel, the highest angel in heaven, to go and, and to speak unto Daniel. And notice this in Daniel 10, verse 13. It says, But the prince of the king of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now Gabriel, the highest angel in heaven, you know, after Lucifer's fall, was sent to influence the king to let the children of Israel go. 
right? To, you know, to give the decree so that they can leave and go rebuild Jerusalem, right? But who is it that withstand, withstood him? Satan. Satan was working against the plot. And, he tr- and for three weeks he was working. And then Michael came and gave them the victory. So what this is telling us is that not even Gabriel can contend with Satan. Only the Son of God and God himself can contend with the devil. Now, if that is true, how about you and me? Can we contend with the devil? Not even for a moment. Notice uh, what Satan did next. Going back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, it said, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now, what did God say just before, or what was the command from God? In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. die. Now, that, if, I, if, if somebody told that, told that to you, and this was a person in authority, I mean, you would think it's going to happen, right? Exactly. But this was from God himself. He says, if you eat of it, you shall die. But what did the serpent say? Ye shall not surely die. Isn't that right? He lied to her. He lied to her, right? But um, he caused her to aspire to a position that God had ordained her not to have. Notice in verse 5, it says this. He goes on, Ye shall not surely die. But then he said, For God doth know, right? So you're not going to die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And so he said, look, you can't trust in God. He doesn't want you to eat of this tree, because if you eat it, you're going to be like him. Now, wait a minute. Wasn't Eve happy with where she was at? Yeah. She was, until she started talking to the serpent, until she separated from her husband and, went and found herself beside the tree. And she started to wonder, why did God not want us to eat of this tree? And then the serpent jumps in, starts a conversation with her, and leads her to do what? To doubt God. Now notice this. The words that he used was designed to doubt God. Notice what Patriarchs and Prophets says at page 59. Eve had been perfectly happy by her husband's side in her Eden home. But like restless modern Eves, she was flattered with the hope of entering a higher sphere than that which God had assigned her. In attempting to, raise abo- to rise above her original position, the one that God had given her, she fell far below it. Notice in Genesis 3, verse 6. No, and, when the woman, oh, sorry, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband, and her husband did eat. Now notice this. Satan had used the beauty of the serpent so as to not alarm Eve to the danger that was about to befall her. Second, he enticed her into a conversation with him. Then he introduced doubt into her mind as to the word of God. Once introduced, he led her to aspire to be like God. When Eve transgressed the law of God, her first act was to lead her husband to transgress transgress as well. Such is the power of sin upon the heart of man. Amen? That is what we're dealing with. Adam's fall was accomplished in a different way than Eve's. Eve was deceived. Adam was not deceived. He did not have a direct confrontation with Satan, as did Eve, but with the new agent of Satan, which was his wife. Adam was not deceived as Eve, but like his wife, he was led to doubt God. Knowing that she would die, knowing that he had, she had the fruit that was forbidden, he knew that she was going to die. He loved her and could not be separated from her. And through this, he began to doubt the love of God to fulfill the void left by this separation. Thus, that's right, he let his his desire for his wife get in the way. Thus he placed the love of his wife above his love for God. Isn't that the way that Satan does that? He gets you to love the things of this world more than the things of God. Taking the fruit, he pledged his love to her and did eat. Amazing, right? 
the very thing that they didn't even want to do, Satan led them to do. Notice in the next verse, in Genesis 3, verse 7, it says, And the eyes of them were both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Once Adam ate of the forbidden fruit, they found themselves naked. This robe of righteousness, this, this holy light that surrounded them was no longer there, and they realized that they were naked. The robe of righteousness that they once had had been taken away. No longer were their natures holy and righteous. Now let's turn to, in our Bibles to uh, the same chapter. Let's going to read verses 8 through 13. And we're going to talk about, we're going to see there the result of sin. How it has changed them from what they used to be, holy and righteous, to what they were now, selfish and self-loving. In verse 8 it says this, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the gar garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. God amongst the trees of the garden. So Jesus was coming to be with them like he had done in the past. And they were now afraid. And in verse 9 it says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and saith unto him, Where art thou? Now let me ask you this. Did he know where they were? Yes. Absolutely. So this was not so that he could find them. What was the reason why God asked them this question? That's right so that they could recognize where they were in relation to him. God had come and they were hiding themselves from him because they were what? They were naked. They certainly weren't innocent. <laughs> they were in sin, exactly, because they had sinned, right? Now, notice in verse 10, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked I hid myself. And then notice the very next thing that, that God says to him. And he said unto him, and he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And notice Adam how he, he just kind of boom. He just calls him out. Did you eat of the fruit? And what did he say? Did he say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did. I'm so sorry. No, exactly right, Brother Walt. He said, he said, and the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to me, she gave me, and I did eat. That's right. He started blaming his wife. And the Lord, turning to the wife, said this. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is it that thou hast done? And the woman said to the, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Did either one of them take responsibility for what they had done? Such is the power of sin upon the heart of the man and of those that commit it. That's right. Notice that they had, they hid themselves. Why did he hid him, hide himself? Because they were naked, right? But were they really naked? Were they physically naked? No, because they sewed fig leaves and they covered themselves. So this nakedness that they felt, what was it? It was spiritual nakedness. Exactly right. Right on, Brother Wall. That's right. They had a knowledge that they had sin. They were feeling the effects of sin upon their hearts. No longer were they holy and righteous. And now they were in the presence of one who was holy and righteous. As such, they hid from him because they recognized their spiritual nakedness before him. That's right. The guilt and pride. Once Jesus inquired of Adam as to why they hid themselves, he blamed his wife for the condition. Just a short while ago, he pledged his love to his wife. I'm going to take, I'm going to die with you. He ate the fruit and he transgressed with her. When Jesus inquired of Eve, she blamed the serpent. But in reality, they were blaming God because the serpent and the woman came from whom? Came from God. Such is the power of sin upon the heart, our heart. Our real problem with sin is this, is that the reason why we went through this story that is well known was to bring us to the point where we recognize where we had fallen from. So our real problem with sin is this. We are sinners not because we have sinned, but that we are sinful by nature. 
Okay? You saw the outplaying of their natures when Jesus came to them. And Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. Neither one of them took responsibility. So the problem with sin is not just that we sin, because you know, sinning is a result of a sinful nature. They, sin, uh, uh, they, they did these things because their natures had been changed. Okay? The very fruit of our carnal hearts is sin. Notice in Jeremiah, turn to Jeremiah. This is a, this is a text that really kind of, Jeremiah 17 verse 9. It really kind of goes to the heart of the matter. Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's what the word of God says about our carnal hearts. Separated from the power of God, we cannot do good. Even the good deeds that we do, separated from God, is sin. Because it comes from a sinful heart. Jesus said of this in Matthew. Go to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. Matthew, chapter 7, verses 16 through 18. Jesus speaking says this in verse 16. Ye shall know them by their, what? By their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruits. Our real problem with sin is that we have a sinful nature, a carnal heart. And unless our hearts are changed, would you agree? Unless our hearts are changed, we cannot do good. Go to the book of Ezekiel. This is a text that I love, and it kind of really goes to the very heart of the matter, and it really shows us what we really need. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. Ezekiel chapter 36, 26 and 27. It says this, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Now notice verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Amen? Amen. That is what God wants to do for us, to give us a new heart, to put his spirit within us. As we accept Jesus as our Savior, we have moved from death unto life. Now notice this. Death unto life. John 5. In the book of John, chapter 5, verses 24 through 26. Jesus is speaking here. John, chapter 5, 24 through 26 says this. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto what? Unto life. Verily I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father has life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. So the life that we receive is what? Is the very life of God himself. Amen? The angels cannot even claim that. The, the, the angels have a holy, righteous life but it is not the life of God. God gives us this life through his son. This is justification by faith. Now notice this. It says we have passed from what? From death unto life. Justification through Jesus Christ, right? Romans 5 verse 1 that, uh, that um, Zach had read. It says, therefore being justified by what? by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace that is spoken here is not a future peace. It's peace now. Once we have accepted Christ as our Savior, we are immediately at peace with God. We are no longer at odds with Him. No longer are we in rebellion against Him. At the moment we accept Christ as our Savior, we receive a new heart. This is the new birth, the one that he talked to Nicodemus about. Unless ye be born again, ye cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Isn't that what he said to him? 
That's right. Born of the Spirit. The Spirit of what? The Spirit of Christ. Right. The Holy Spirit. But notice the next verse. So the first verse is talking about justification by faith. Verse 2 says this. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now think about this. If I'm rejoicing in hope of something that is to come, is that now? No. This is sanctification. The glory of God that comes from the indwelling of the Spirit. Right? It is faith on the Son of God that we have access to this grace. And it is by grace that we have hope of the glory of God. This points to our sanctification. But notice, is this sanctification something that happens immediately? Is it presently given to us? The answer is no. We look forward to the completion of the work of Christ within us. Sanctification leads, you know, this leads us to the second part of our study today. Sanctification. So sanctification happens when? When does sanct, I mean, I'm sorry, justification. When does justification happen? When we accept Christ as our Savior. When does sanctification begin? At the same time, okay? But justification is immediate. Sanctification is a process. Notice what Christ Object Lessons, page 65, says. And it's liken it to the germination of a seed. Listen to what she says. The germination of the seed represents the beginning. Notice that the beginning of spiritual life. And the development of the plant is a beautiful figure of Christian growth. As in nature, so in grace, there can be no life without growth. The plant must either grow or die, as, it, as its growth is silent and imperceptible, but continuous, so is the development of the Christian life. At every stage of the development, our life may be perfect. Now notice that. At every stage, it may be perfect. Yet, if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be a continual advancement. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. That's from the pen of inspiration. So sanctification is the work of developing characters for heaven. Though we are justified by faith, our lives must be brought into harmony with the will of God, right? Testimonies for the Church, volume 2, page 430 says this. A heavenly character must be acquired on earth. Now where did I say, where do we get this? this um, uh, heavenly character? Do we get it when we go to heaven? Do we get it when we're resurrected and go to heaven? It says a heavenly character must be acquired here on this earth. My brother, because she was talking to this brother, she says, my brother, or ye will never possess it. Therefore, you should engage at once in the work which you have to do. You should labor earnestly to obtain a fitness for heaven. Live for heaven live for by faith now I want you to notice something the labor that we do is not for our salvation she's saying we must labor to be fitted for heaven but this labor is not a labor that gets us heaven this is a labor with Christ the labor is the work of developing a character for heaven the inroads that sin has upon our characters is deep would you agree we still feel these draws to do the things that we know we shouldn't do. No sin can be partaken of without leaving an impression upon our characters. Thus, these impressions need to be worked out, right? What did Jesus say when he was going to heaven? He said in, in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, let, your not, let not your heart be troubled, right? Well, he did say that in another verse, but he said, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. I, in my Father's house, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am ye may be also. So what he's saying there is that 
He's not so much preparing heaven for us as he's preparing us for heaven. 1 John 1 verse 9, very short verse, says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here we see both justification and sanctification. If we confess that we are sinners, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins. This is justification. The cleansing from all unrighteousness is sanctification. So let's talk real briefly about the cleansing of the sanctuary. In the sanctuary above, Jesus is performing a work of sanctification. He is applying his blood. Now what does the blood represent? The life, right? Because the life is in the blood. And so this blood, this symbol, he's applying his blood or his life, right, to our sins, thus cleansing our sins in the heavenly sanctuary above. Notice in Hebrews 9 verse 12, it says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the most holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Jesus, our high priest, is applying his blood. He's applying his life on, account, on our account in heaven. Notice 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. It says this, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Would you, would you say amen to that, brothers amen. and sisters? Who is the Holy Spirit? Is it the third person of the Godhead? like the Trinity teaches? No, no it is the Spirit no, of Christ. Christ. Notice in Romans 8, 9, and 10. Because you remember when you guys were, a, you were answering God, the Spirit, Holy Spirit, the Son of God, we, and they all were the same thing? This verse in Romans 8, 9, and 10, 10 shows how the Apostle Paul used these things as if they were one. Notice in verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, ye, if so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. So he's talking about the Spirit of God, right? So if the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Beautiful, isn't it? Colossians 1.27 To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. My friends, the work that Jesus is doing in the heavenly sanctuary above is doing by, he's doing also by the, his spirit within our hearts today. So as he's cleansing the heavenly sanctuary, he's also cleansing the sanctuary of our hearts. Would you agree with that? While we are justified by faith, we also are to live our lives by faith. Romans 1.17. Go ahead, brother. Well, what about Romans uh, 5, 3 to 6? Go ahead and read it. Uh, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured unto our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Amen. That's saying the exact same thing. That it's the work of Christ within our hearts. That is the work of sanctification. And that's what Jesus is doing up in heaven, but by his spirit, he's doing that in our hearts. Romans 1.17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. faith. Amen. Our work is to surrender our hearts to the working of Jesus within our hearts. Paul said, I die daily. 1 Corinthians 15.31, right? So we must die daily to, the, to, the, to our carnal hearts. 1 Corinthians 15.34 says, Awake, notice this, Awake to righteousness and sin not. So we have to put forth this effort not to sin. 
But we don't do it in our own carnal natures. We do it by the Spirit of Christ. That's why it says, awake to righteousness as it is in Jesus Christ. 1 John 2 verse 1. This is one that you probably should already, already know. It says, my little children, these things write unto ye that ye sin not. So he's exhorting them not to sin. But then he says, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Who is it? Jesus, Jesus Christ the righteous. In both of these texts, the apostles is, are exhorting us to not sin, to live a holy life, to live a life of faith. Before we have given our lives to the Lord in our own sin uh, nature that we sin, now that we have the new birth of Jesus within our hearts, we need to learn to do good, right? This is the process of sanctification. The deep impress of sin within our characters must be worked out. This is the process of sanctification, and this is why it is the work of a lifetime. Isaiah 1, 16 and 17 says this, Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. And in verse 17 says, learn to do well. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. And so as we are to cease to do sin, cease to do evil, we are exhorted to learn to do well. That's sanctification, my brothers and sisters. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 460 says this, yet we have a work to do to resist temptation. Now notice this, we have a work to do. But does this work save us? No, it doesn't. Christ saves us. But the work that we are doing, we are doing in, co uh, in cooperation with the Spirit of Christ that is now within us, right? He is the one that gives us the power to stop sinning. So she said, yet we have a work to do to resist temptation. Those who would not fall prey to Satan's devices. Now, how many of you do not want to fall prey to Satan's devices? Raise your hand. Let the record show that everybody raise their hand. And Jeff is raising his hand right now. Okay. All right. It says, those who would not fall prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. The mind should not be left to wander at random upon every subject that the adversary of soul may suggest. Notice it's a suggestion, right? 1 Peter 1, 13 through 15 says this, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, right? So it says, guard your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the re revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashion yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And so we are to guard well the avenues of our mind, to not put before our minds the things that will suggest sinful thoughts. Our part in the sanctification of our souls is to resist the devil. We are to guard well the avenues of our soul. We must cease to do evil and learn to do well. How do we do this? One of the opening texts that we had in John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. By spending time with Jesus in his word. The great controversy, the 1888 version, page 519 says this. Satan well knows that all whom he can lead to neglect prayer and the searching of the scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. Therefore, he invites, invents every possible device to engro engross the mind. Now notice something. It says, all whom he can get to neglect prayer and the searching of the scriptures, that means the studying of your Bibles. It says, will. It didn't say maybe, it didn't say might, it says will, it's a certainty that if we neglect those two things, Satan will overcome us by his attacks. Amen, brother. Notice that this is a certainty. Therefore, we must avoid the things that will lead us into sin. What is one of the things that will commonly lead us into sin? Temptation. Okay, that's, that's a temptation, but what are the devices that Satan has given us? 
Television is one, right? The internet, novels, worldly magazines, worldly music, worldly activities, sports. You can go on and on and on. The thing is, is that he has, give, has all of these things designed to distract your mind from God, right? To introduce doubt into your mind. Notice Philippians 4, 7 through 9. This is where I had this beautiful, you know, this, this beautiful text that I was telling you about this morning. Philippians 4, 7 through 9 says this, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ. Finally, brethren, and notice this, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any vir virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Isn't that what God wants us to do? Didn't the psalmist say that he didn't want to put anything before his eyes that would lead him to sin? Verse 9 says, Those things which ye have been learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So as we look upon the things that are righteous, this is holy and righteous. Look at this. Beautiful creation here. Right? God will be with us. So in closing... Many times we worry if we will make it to heaven. Have you ever worried? I've worried because I've looked at my life and it says, how is it that God is going to save me? My friends, I'm here to tell you today, if you have accepted Christ as your Savior, you need not worry. You are already saved. Your salvation is not based upon your performance. It's based upon your relationship with whom? Jesus Christ. So we don't have to worry about that. Right? Sanctification is the process of fitting us for heaven. This work we have a part to play in. But it is Christ that is responsible for completing this work. Now notice this. Philippians 1 verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he, talking about Jesus Christ, which be hath begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's his second coming, right? So he will be faithful to take care of this process of fitting you for heaven. It's not your process. It's not my process. All we have to do is to surrender to it, to be in communi communion with him, not neglecting prayer and the searching of the scripture. Because, brother, you were telling me earlier, in Hebrews 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. God is the one that is responsible for fitting you for heaven. He has already provided you with salvation. You have it. If you've accepted Christ, the Spirit of Christ is living within you. Now the work of sanctification goes on in our lives today. As we resist temptation in the Spirit of Christ, we will gain the victory. In James chapter 4, verse 7, it says this, Submit yourself therefore unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In verse 8 it says, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. This is the process of sanctification. As we surrender our wills to God every single day, what is it? I die how often? Day. Daily. As we die daily to Christ and accept him as our Savior, and then as we resist temptation, we are not resisting temptation in our own strength. We are resisting temptation in the one who has gained the victory over Satan. And that is Jesus Christ the righteous.